next level because game developers couldn't count on it being there. Which meant that if you were going to build a connect title, you built a connect title. You made a little purple box. People went, realized, oh, if it's purple on it, I got to have a connect, so therefore I'm not going to buy it unless I have one of those. We couldn't make a purplish green box where there were some connect enabled features. And we did do a little bit of that. Skyrim, for example, lets you do the shouts through connect, where you could go fusro ka yourself and actually blow people back. That's how much Skyrim I play is I actually know all the shouts by heart, um, which is, you know, gives you an example of how much free time I have. Um, but it was a very different world suddenly with this Kinect device being attached. So with Xbox One, we decided, you know, one or two unique features was interesting, but why don't we just go crazy? <laughs> so we put a Kinect in every single box. We also have Smart Glass now. For those of you who have played with that, it is significantly beyond what it could do before. Um, Smart Glass today lets you completely immerse gamers in your game in ways that you couldn't before. Probably the best example of this is if you've played Dead Rising 3. In Dead Rising 3, if you have a smart device attached, a lot of the interactions with the game happen through the smart device. In fact, one of the most unnerving things that can happen with the smart device is when you get a call in the game, your phone rings next to you. Okay? Believe me, if you weren't immersed in the game by that point, <laughs> you are after that. You know, so you take the call, you put the phone down, then you realize, like, is anyone in the room with me? Because, you know, it's also very connect enabled, right? It's possible, for example, to yell and to attract the zombies by making noise. And by attracting the zombies and pulling them to you, you can get around them. There are tactics involved. It also means that if you have a little sister and you're playing Dead Rising 3, she can make life for the older brother hard. <laughs> Because while he's in the middle of trying to get through something, she will just pop up and go, hey, woohoo, over here, zombies, come on. And uh, he just loves that. <laughs> and then I have to pull them apart and send them to different corners. And, uh, yeah, it's all good. We also have Xbox Cloud Computing with this one. We'll talk about that in a second. I don't want to go into detail yet on that one. But that's basically, again, the ability to use uh, the Azure CPU cores to be able to run stuff. We have fast app switching. today. When you want to switch apps, you can punch the Nexus button. Your game will shrink down, continue to run, and let you go do something else. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works here in a second. We have cloud storage for all these pieces, which we've already talked about. This is both save games and the ability to store additional, or be able to use um, the storage for things like uh, persistent things relative to the game itself, for example. So the game can actually store pieces off in the cloud and then come get them back if it needs to. We have the SRAM, which we'll talk about next, which is basically an extension of the GPU. And this box is quiet. How quiet is it? When we were getting the hardware up and running, I, of course, had like boxes that were fresh out of the factory, <laughs> boxes in the sense that I had a motherboard sitting on my desk, <laughs> um, with a fan blowing full blast on it, which was very, I mean, you know, it was like seriously in the 80 to 90 dB range. That's how loud this fan was. And so you'd be developing for your Xbox. You'd turn it on, you'd get something done, and then you'd turn it off because <laughs> you couldn't think in your office. Well, about three weeks into this, I got a new recovery, which is basically a new Flash uh, operating system and kernel and everything else for it. Flashed it, and the fan turned off. And I'm like, oh, great, we broke it. So I was really sad. So, but I'm like, OK, but you know, part of what I'm doing is kind of stressing everything and seeing how it's working. So I decided, you know what, the fan's off, that's great. I'm just going to throw something really GPU intensive at it and heat the GPU up and see what it does. Let's see how long it takes it to thermally shut down or burst into flames or whatever it's going to do. <laughs> so I ran that. I figured I'll get up, get a cup of coffee. I'll come back. It'll be powered down, whatever. I come back, it's still running, still running at frame rate. Everything is working great. And I look and the fan's on, but it's running slow enough to where you can't hear it and it's still pulling heat off. That was breathtaking to me, and it never went above that any time that I've ever run anything with it. So we did a really good job keeping it quiet this time. ESRAM is dedicated RAM in 32 megabytes. It sits right next to the GPU. In fact, it's on the other side of the GPU from the buses that talk to the rest of the system. So the GPU is the only thing that can see this memory. And what it does is it gives you very, very high bandwidth output and read capability from the GPU as well. This is useful because in a lot of cases, especially when we have as large a content as we have today of five gigabytes that could potentially be touched to render something, anything we can move to memory that has a bandwidth that's on the order of two to 10x faster 
uh, then the regular system memory is going to be a huge win. So this is where you put things that you're going to read a lot, like a shadow map. This is where you're going to put things that you draw to a lot, like your back buffer. We have resource creation settings that allow you to put things into here. They don't have to all reside in ESRAM. There can be pieces of it that can reside in regular memory as well. So for example, if I'm a racing game, and I know that the top third of my screen is usually sky, and that sky doesn't get touched very much, great, let's leave that in regular memory. We'll put the fast memory down here where I have to draw all the cars. This works for practically any D3D resource there is, buffers, textures, uh, of any flavors. Um, there's no CPU access here, because the CPU can't see it. It's got to go through the GPU to get to it, and we didn't enable that. So what that means is that you can't have the back buffer in there. In other words, the thing that's going to draw out of the TV, finally, can't live in ESRAM. So the last thing you have to do after you get it all composited up is copy it over to main memory. And that copy over to main memory is really fast and doesn't use any CPU or GPU time either because we have DMA engines that actually do that for you in the console. This is how you get to 1080p. This is how you run at 60 frames per second, period, if you're bottlenecked by graphics. Xbox Cloud Computing. When I started working on Xbox One, um, one of the first things I did, for those of you who've ever seen any of the old XNA talks that I gave, uh, especially one that PDC, I think, back in 2008, I showed a, a game that I wrote called Savage Frontier. And Savage Frontier is a game where I have a solar system, our solar system, in fact, all the planets, all of the moons, all the known asteroids, all in 3D, all moving at the right places, all in the right places at the right times, I have all the stars out to 3,500 light years in three space, so you can actually fly out of the solar system and visit all these stars if you want to. I have all the planet data for those stars that we've discovered in place. And I have another three million stars representing um, the things that we have very accurate 2D positions for from a spatial perspective on the, on the sphere of the celestial heavens, but not from a distance perspective because we couldn't get enough parallax from the satellite that recorded all these positions. So what you see when you run Savage Frontier is this incredibly beautiful vista of all these stars, the Milky Way being rendered the way nature renders the Milky Way with literally millions of little stars. And I'm really seriously abusing the GPU here in ways that, frankly, I shouldn't be allowed to do. But it really stresses it well, so this is why we did it. There are 489,000 known asteroids where we have an orbit good enough for me to be able to plot them. I can't draw 489,000 asteroids at once. There isn't enough CPU in the box to be able to do that. So what we did was we wrote something that lived up in the cloud that would process some number of asteroids and would feed those asteroids back. And as soon as I had two positions, I could dead reckon between them and get the asteroid moving. And I would get another position and another position and another position, maybe in 10 to 20 second intervals, but it turns out they move slow enough to where that doesn't matter. They're still incredibly accurate positions for where these guys are which means that I can fly to them if I want to. I can draw them all in exactly the right place, and I'm using almost no CPU time on the box to be able to do this. Okay? Let's assume the worst case scenario happens and I lose my connection to the cloud. All right, well, I still have enough dead reckoning to keep these guys moving for some amount of time. And in fact, we did the measurements, and it turns out that you'd have to lose the internet for about two hours before these things would be far enough in their orbits to where they're actually off their orbit by more than the radius of the asteroid itself. Okay, that's how slow they move, and that's why it's a perfect application for this. This is the kind of thing game developers can use to create very rich, very deep worlds that we haven't even imagined or seen yet, where whole economies could be being simulated in the cloud. Whole sets of characters in cities that you're nowhere near could actually be running their AIs. The plot could be moving forward. All of these things could be happening in real time. Because as long as they're happening in the cloud and can get updated in time for the player to notice them, you're fine. This is a huge deal. Not only that, this is the definition of MMO. <laughs> right? The server for an MMO is this. It runs in the cloud. It runs the world. It sends back the results to the players that are attached to it. Titanfall makes extensive use of this. In fact, Titanfall is a multiplayer game all the time, even when you're in the tutorials. The logic for Titanfall, even in the tutorials, is running here. It's not running on the console. Process lifetime management. As I said, there was a shared OS and the normal exclusive OS. And these can all be in different modes. 
So for example, the shared OS is always running. And the normal exclusive OS can be running, which means the game is full screen. But I can also constrain the game by hitting the Nexus or Home button. Game shrinks down to that big tile that's on the screen. And now the game is constrained. We'll talk about what that means in a second. But then I can also suspend it. If I move away from the game, if I go look at Bing full screen, do a whole bunch of searches, some amount of time later the game gets shut down. It gets a notification that says, hey, buddy, I'm putting you away because I'm not using all this power if you're not coming back to me in a timely manner. And we suspend the game. The game can either be reconstituted because I decide to go play it again, in which case we simply start giving it CPU again, or we might decide to play another game, in which case it gets shot without ever coming back to life. And so it's up to the games to realize that when they get suspended, they have stuff to do. They need to save their state. And they get one second to do that before we starve them. You can also have just the shared OS running in the box today. That's actually relatively easy to do. You can go to that constrained tile and actually quit the game. The game will shut down will deconstitute the exclusive OS partition, and the box will just be running in shared OS. We can also put the box into two different low power modes. One is really low power, where it's just ticking over. The other is uh, higher power, um, and can do things like take an update in the background while it's running. It turns on very, very quickly. You can say Xbox on, and it turns on. Right? All of those things are really cool, and that's the other low power mode that we can be in. But the idea here is that you can fold the system into whatever shape you need it to do, based on all of those criteria that we originally talked about. If I need an app, great, here's the app. If I need more than one app, great, we know how to do that. If I need to run a game and have an app running in the background snapped in over here, yeah, we know how to do that too. We can fold the system into all of these different shapes as we need them. And there's very, very little work for the game developer to do other than to catch that suspend and resume event so that they can make the right decisions about what their game is supposed to do when they get that. When their game goes constrained, we actually take cores away from them, too. So they go from six cores down to four. And we take the workloads that are on the two cores, four and five, and we move them on to two and three, which means two and three are almost certainly going to be overloaded. We're also going to take away 50% of the GPU. So the game isn't going to be able to run at 60 frames per second anymore. But that's OK, because in a lot of cases, when you do this to a game, they pause. And once they pause, you're free to do whatever you want to it. There's no controller focus, obviously, because it's not <laughs> the focus anymore. But we do give them 100% of the network. The reason for that is because we don't want them to abruptly drop their multiplayer game if the person decided to constrain them while they were in a multiplayer match or doing something multiplayer with their friends. They may have made a mistake, and they go, oops, wrong button. Let me come back. But we will give them that 100% of the network focus until they go suspended. They get one second from the time the fire event fires to, to get it back. Uh, and the game may never wake up, so you have to save the state. If it does wake up, you get a resume event, which tells you that you weren't reconstituted. You've actually been, or you, we didn't need to reload you. You've actually been here the whole time. Just pick up where you left off. The reason you get that event is because a lot of games use the wall clock for timing. right? And if they've been paused for some amount of time and you come back six, seven hours later, the rest of the world may be six, seven hours down the simulation further than it was which means all the cars in the racetrack have long since finished and you just came in last, which is not a very good experience. So don't do that. <laughs> Connected storage, this is where we give you the save game capability. You've got 16 megabytes. We guarantee it will get to the cloud. Um, you decide how the player picks it up when you get back. Uh, probably your whole save game won't fit in 16 megabytes, especially if you just try to stream the entire data set that's there. So you have to think about it a little bit more than you would normally to do the connected storage pieces. But this is not one 16 megabyte block for all the save games of all eternity. This is every save game that you have can be 16 megabytes in size. And then we put it to the cloud for you. Streaming install is important because today we don't let you play from the optical disk at all. When you put an optical disk in, we actually install your game for you. The same way we do it as if you were attached to the cloud and you downloaded it. Okay? The key is that we don't want to have to wait for all 50 gigabytes off that disk or all 50 gigabytes of that download to either complete or install before you start playing, because that's a ridiculously long period of time. So what we did was we came up with a system that allowed game developers to grab that most important two to three gigabytes that the game actually has to have to start running and get the game going. And that's what streaming install does. Okay? 
This is a hard problem to solve because if you only needed two or three gigabytes for people to play your game, that's all you'd ship.